This morning we're reading from, um, I put my glasses on. I can see it. Um, Mark 1, 29 through 39. And immediately Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning, everybody. There you go. Three weeks away, I forgot how to use the microphone. Uh, well, good morning. Welcome to Wingfoot Church. My name is John. It's uh, really good to be home after a couple weeks uh, away. Uh, I was really jealous of y'all, though, because you got to hear from some of my favorite people uh, sharing from Scripture. Uh, I was watching from afar and uh, encouraged. I just, uh, we, I really love this church. And I love you guys. Uh, and I love being in this space. You know, upstairs is beautiful, but downstairs it's like, oh, look at the people. All right, look at around the table just gathered and uh, spending time together this morning. Uh, if you're here with us for the first time, I want to welcome you, and maybe it's a little like, oh, I didn't know I was going to be sitting around a table with someone uh, in church, but uh, this is what church is about, and it's not just about a service, it's about a community of people coming together uh, and encouraging one another and following Jesus together, uh, which is a really beautiful thing. Uh, so I just came back from a couple weeks of vacation, and uh, one of the things about going on vacation, I don't know if you've realized this, but like getting ready to go on vacation is stressful. Right? It's like by the time I'm on vacation, I need a vacation for my prep for vacation. Uh, and so like, as we were getting away, this is actually, I think, uh, one of the, the most uh, intentional times that Kelly and I have stepped back from all the things that are going here for a couple years. And so it was really like, okay, what are all the things that are on my to-do list, and how can I make sure I get all of them done? Because I am really great at making to-do lists and really terrible at completing to-do lists. Uh, and so I was like, I, gotta, I have to get through all these things, all these things that I've been pushing off for a long time. Uh, and so I, I, I did it, right? I was, like, texting some people, like, Friday night, like, at 10 o'clock before I was leaving the next morning because I just needed to get it off my plate. Uh, and so then you're on vacation. When you're on vacation, there's no to-dos. I'm, like, I'm going to go to a beach. I'm going to read a book, and I'm going to take a nap. Those are my to-do lists, right? Is anybody, that's your ideal vacation? Some of you vacationers are like, I have an agenda. I don't know how you how you do that as a vacation. Uh, but it, so it was great. And so one of the things that, you know, on vacation, I'm like reflecting and resting. And I'm saying, when I come back, I want to do things differently. Any of you do that like when you're on vacation, you're like, things are going to be different. I'm going to get there and I'm going to I'm gonna start exercising. I'm going to get home and start eating healthy because we all know we eat terrible on vacation. I'm going to go home and I'm going to rest more. Uh, so I was just reflecting on this, feel really encouraged, and then I turn the corner to come home, and my yard desperately needs mowed, and I hate mowing my yard, right? And so all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, here's reality. Vacation was great, but I have a to-do list of things, and my yard keeps growing, right? One of these days, you're going to drive by my house, and it's going to be AstroTurf, because I'm just tired of it. But we feel that, right? We live very, like, busy lives, right? Even if you're, like, a pretty chill person, there's a lot of things that you have to do. We live very fast-paced lives, and the problem is that we have all this technology that just lets us do things even faster, 
Right? They used to say that you know, technology is going to get to the point where we're going to work like 20-hour work weeks. I would, like, most people work 50-hour work weeks now. We have more technology and more access and more efficiency, and yet it seems like we're doing more and more things. I want to try a thought experiment with you this morning. Uh, and I want you, so you, some of you have pens, papers, that's great. Maybe you have a phone. I want you to think about in the next 24 hours, so between now and tomorrow morning at whatever it is, 11 a.m., what are all the things that you have to do? What are all the things that you have to do between now and tomorrow morning at 11 a.m.? I'm going to give you about maybe 30 seconds to think about it, maybe build a list. Some of you type A people, you have your list already. Review your list. Just take a couple minutes and think, okay, after I leave church this morning, uh, what is waiting for me between now and if you work on Monday mornings, when I get to work on Monday morning? Just kind of build your list for a second. Give you 20 more seconds. Five seconds. All right. Some of you all might be really mad. You're like, Sunday is my day of rest. You're making me think about work. I am I'm sorry. I know. Uh, but it's part of the thought experiment. All right. So I'm just curious, like, how many of you in the next 24 hours have at least five things on your to-do list? Okay. 10, 15, 10. We're like 10, 15. Okay, that, that's better than I thought it was going to be. Okay, so some of you are really embracing a Sabbath lifestyle on Sundays. That's great. But chances are, if I ask you tomorrow, hey, what's on your list for the next 24 hours, it would be a much different list, right? Because there's a lot of things that we have to do. And, and, and in the stress and the busyness of life, it becomes really overwhelming. Right? We become slaves to our to-do list. And then if we're honest, like, if you add, like, being part of a church community, right, or being part of a spiritual community, that's sometimes a whole other list of things that you have to do. And so maybe, you, you know, if you're a follower of Jesus, you go to work, and, and you're, like, your coworkers who don't go to church, they're stressed out. But then they look at you, and, the, and you're as stressed out, but you also are like, I'm in church, and so I do these things, too. And they're like, why would you do that? That just adds stress to your life. And if we're honest, sometimes the to-do list only grows when you follow Jesus. So what I want to do this morning in the passage that we just read, if you have a Bible, I want you to open it up to Mark chapter 1. Uh, whether you've got a book, you've got a phone, uh, I want to look at 24 hours in Jesus' life, a day in the life of Jesus. To say, what did he have on his plate? How did he manage his to-do list? And, and, and what was it about him and how he did these things that we can learn from? Because after all, if we're followers of Jesus, that doesn't just mean that I agree with all the teachings. It also means that I practice the life that he lived. I embrace the rhythms that he embraced. I, I seek to love people as he loved people, not just check the box on, yes, I like his teaching, but how do I actually live like he lived? And so in Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 29, we're actually going to uh, skip up to 21 real quick. We didn't read it this morning, but 21 is where the day begins. All right, so Mark chapter 1. Verse 21, it says, And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue. Now, if you go a couple of verses right before that, Jesus has just gathered a couple of disciples. And so the day begins with them, you could say, loading into the van and going to church. Right? And, and depending on how old you think the disciples are, they're teenagers, right? And so Jesus loaded the van full of teenagers and went to church. Some of you are like, I, I felt that. I got the kids. That's, that's a to-do list all in itself, right? So the first thing that they do is they get up and they go to a gathering. But then the next thing is that Jesus is not just 
sitting there in the back. He's actually teaching. And so he gets everyone in the car, gets to church, then he teaches, and his teaching has this authority. And so people have questions. And so now people want to talk to him afterwards. They want to know more about what he said afterwards. And so he's now managing a crowd of people and their expectations and their thoughts and the things that they want to know. And then, and then in the midst of this, so he's gone to church, he's taught, he's now fielding questions. There's someone there with an unclean spirit or a demon possession, and Jesus cast that demon out. And this creates such uh, a, an uproar that in verse 29 it says his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding regions of Galilee. So by noon, Jesus has gone viral. He hasn't even had lunch yet. Well, let's look at his lunch plans. He has lunch plans. Verse 29, immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. So after synagogue, he now goes out to lunch. And you have to wonder about Simon in this story. Because Simon's mother-in-law is sick, and he said, hey, boys, why don't you come over to my house? Right? Like, like Simon, his mother-in-law is laying ill, apparently on the verge of death, and yet he's like, can you like, host us and Jesus at your house? Right, which is pretty on par for Simon and his character. But it says in verse 30 that, that they get into the house and immediately they ask Jesus to heal her. He hasn't even taken his sandals off, and he has another thing to do. It's already been a long morning, and now he's healing Simon's mother-in-law. And it seems like there's a little bit of a break there. But then in the evening, at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. He healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And so evening comes around, and he's doing the same thing. He's healing. He's casting out demons. He's probably teaching. He's managing a crowd of people. And verse 33 is really, I, I, I've been reflecting on this this week, because it says the whole city gathered together at the door. And I just started to, like, put myself in that space for a moment and just said, like, what if, what if like, this whole neighborhood gathered at our door? There's 22,000 people or so here just in Goodyear Heights. And I started to think, man, how many people are sick in this neighborhood? How many, how many people are, like, in the, in the oppression of addiction in some form in our neighborhood? And how many marriages are on the brink how many, how many kids have significant needs in our neighborhood? Like, if the whole city was coming to our door, on the one hand, like, praise God, because we have the opportunity to minister, but that is overwhelming to think about. And yet, that's where Jesus is. The whole city is coming to him. And so apparently, at some point, the crowd disperses, and they all nap at Simon's house. But verse 35 says this, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. So first thing in the morning, Jesus gets up, and it says he, he goes to a desolate place. Now that doesn't mean a place of destruction or a place of rubble. It's a, it's a place of, uh, of solitude, a place of where he can be alone. Like if this was here in Goodyear Heights, he'd probably be uh, somewhere in the Metro Park. You wouldn't be able to know where in the Metro Park. He'd probably be off the trail in the Metro Park, just seeking some space where he can be alone and where he can pray. And I want you to see that, that the, the, the bottom line of Jesus' to-do list and how he manages all these things is that Jesus' work, all the things, all the ministry, all the tasks that he has, all of those things begin with prayer. Jesus begins from a place of prayer. Right? If you read Mark, it seems like this is actually Jesus' first day of ministry. If you look at verse 14 uh, and 15, uh, he had, or sorry, verse 12, he had been in the wilderness. He had spent 40 days in prayer with the Spirit, being filled and, and being trained and, and being ris uh, strengthened by the Holy Spirit. And then he steps out into this whirlwind day of ministry with all these things. And the next day, what's he doing? He's getting up early, going to a place of solitude, and he's praying. You see, Jesus' work 
began with prayer. And in fact, if you look at the, the rhythm of the life of Jesus, anytime he had something really significant coming up, whether it was the transfiguration, whether it was his temptation, whether it was uh, his, his arrest and his crucifixion, whether it was his, him picking the disciples, anytime he had something significant coming up, he spent a significant amount of time in prayer before that. So much so that you could say that the, the effectiveness of Jesus' ministry was directly tied to his prayer life and the time that he spent in communion with God. I see, I think it's really important that first we talk about, okay, what is prayer? What it, when it says he's, he's praying, what does that mean he's doing? Because lots of religions and spiritualities have a prayer or a kind of prayer uh, posture, but what is Jesus doing? You see, for followers of Jesus, prayer is about connecting and communing with God. It's not about emptying ourselves and, and achieving some sort of oneness. It's not about uh, uh, just getting away from all the things. It is about connecting with God, connecting with the God who created us and who made us, connecting with the God of Jesus. And so what prayer is, is he steps out of the to-do list and he spends time with his Father, and out of that then begins his work. And you see, if we're honest, if I'm honest, I often do it the opposite. Where, where I begin with my work, I begin with the things that I have on my list or my agenda or the things that I want to do, and, and, I, and I get it all laid out, and I build a strategy and a plan for how I'm going to manage my workflow and manage my efficiency and, and, and how we're going to reach people. I build this plan, and then I, I resort to prayer when my plan doesn't work. I'm like, oh, I'm stuck. God, would you help me? Or I'm overwhelmed. God, would you give me the strength to tackle the things that I, I have on my list? You see, I often begin with my work and then resort to prayer when things get difficult. But for Jesus, he began with prayer. That prayer was, in fact, the most important part of his work. And out of that, then, he ministered. Out of that, then, he healed. Out of that, then, he taught. And so why is it that we get this mixed up? Why is it that we tackle our work until we get stuck and then we pray? I think there's a couple things that we forget along the way. There's four things that I think we forget that lead to us forgetting prayer. And not beginning with prayer, but only resorting to prayer when things get stressful. The first thing that we forget is we forget grace. We forget grace. You see, followers of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus tell us that, that prayer is not about convincing God to pay attention to us. Which sometimes religious approaches to prayer are that very thing. It's like if you pray in this particular way, or in this particular direction, or recite this kind of thing then you'll be connected to God. But that's not how prayer works for followers of Jesus. The followers of Jesus believe that our connection with God is based on grace, which means that you don't earn it or deserve it. You see, Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. That the way that you get connected to God is not through your prayer or through your behavior, or through trying to get God's attention by waving at him, the way that you get connected to God is through Jesus and his grace. And that if you are a follower of Jesus, which means that if you have turned from your sin and you have trusted in what Jesus did for you, the door to God is always open. It doesn't matter how good you were this week or how bad you were this week. It doesn't matter what words you say or what words you don't say. If you are a follower of Jesus, the door is always open because Jesus is that door. Which is really good news if you are unsure of how to pray. Right, like if you didn't grow up in religious or spiritual spaces, prayer might seem like really weird. Like, what do I do? I close my eyes? Do I hum? Do I meditate? Like, what do I do? But if you're a follower of Jesus, Prayer is never about what you do. It's about grace. It's about knowing the God who loves you and made you and who gave his son for you. And so maybe you don't have the words. That's okay. Maybe you stumble. Maybe you're not sure what to say. It doesn't change that the door is open for you when you know who Jesus is. So don't forget grace. I think the second thing that we often forget is that we forget our need. We forget our need. Jesus said in, in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
and I don't think we believe him. Right? Apart from me, you can do nothing. We, we listen to that and we say, yes, okay, my salvation is not about me. It's based on grace. It's based on what Jesus did. But then we often act as if the fruitfulness of my life or the effectiveness of my life or my growth in ministry or my growth in understanding in Jesus, well, that's on me. Now, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that word nothing in the Greek means nothing. Right? And so we forget our need. And so oftentimes I put my plan together or I say, this is what I have on my agenda. God, would you bless it? God, would you work in it? Rather than beginning from a place of, I have a desperate need of knowing you, Jesus. That my plans are worthless without you. That I am ineffective without you. See, in the context of that teaching, Jesus uses this image of a vine uh, and, and the fruit on the vine. And he's saying this, if you want fruitfulness in your life, right, if, you want, if you want to see transformation in your life, if you want to know who I am more, if you want to see your, your neighbors come to know who Jesus is, if you want to grow in me, the only way that you can do that is by being connected to me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. When my wife and I went on vacation, she's been growing cherry tomatoes. And when we left for vacation, there was very little on the vine. When we came back, there were cherry tomatoes for days. I'm sick of cherry tomatoes at this point. There's so many cherry tomatoes. What did we do? We were on vacation. The vine continued to feed the fruit. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. And so it's an invitation and a reminder that if we want to be effective as a church, what is what? If we want to see people come to faith, if we want to see uh, chains of addiction broken, it's not about our plans or our strategies. That if we throw the best block parties in the world and have the best Sunday service in the world, but we are not committed to being people of prayer, then we are wasting our time. Remember our need. Third thing is we often forget our identity. We often forget our identity. Jesus told a parable. He said this, How many of you parents know how to give good gifts to your kids. Right? Some of you are like, yeah, I, I, I do. I give pretty good gifts. Right? As a parent, you're like, okay, what does my kid want? Uh, I may hate that thing, but it would, it would mean that they feel loved, right? Musical instruments for kids is a terrible idea, but kids love it. As a parent, you say, I'm willing to give to them. I'm willing to care for them. I'm willing to give them the gift that they're really hoping for. Jesus said, if you know how to give a good gift to your kid, how much more so does your heavenly father care about you? You see, through Jesus, prayer is not about trying to convince God to care about you. He already cares about you. Your identity is as a son or a daughter adopted into his family through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so your standing with him is secure. And so when we pray, it's not about trying to get God to look at us. He's already looking at you. He's already caring about you. And so prayer is coming back to the heart of our Father and remembering what he says about us, remembering his concern and his love for us. And so often when we're prayerless, it's because we've forgotten our identity as his son or as his daughter. The last thing that we often forget or we miss is the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer. I want you to see what Jesus does here. So, so he's, he's spent this time in prayer in the morning. And verse 36 says, Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. Right? Do you feel that sometimes? Like everyone has an expectation for me. Or, or your to-do list. Like, how many of that is, like, doing things for other people? Or doing things in order to keep people happy or to keep your boss off you? Or, or to do all these things? Like, oftentimes, our busyness and our to-do is, is actually about searching for or the approval of other people. What does Jesus say? He says, he says, no. He essentially says, no. He says, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. See, oftentimes I think we think the purpose of prayer is to tell God what I need so that he will answer my prayers. But for Jesus, that's not what happened here. You see, he spent time in prayer with his father. And out of that time of prayer, he was able to then discern all the things that were in front of him and choose those things that were the best things 
choose those things that were the true things that he should do, and then set everything else aside. You see what happens when we spend time in prayer, being reminded of the grace of God, being reminded of our need, and being reminded of our identity as his son or daughter, is that in that place we, where we're reminded of his love, we're better able to then step out of that space of prayer and look at the work that's in front of me. Look at the relationships that are in front of me and say, okay, if I'm really loved by God, then how would that change that, the hectic nature of my life? How would that change all the things that I'm doing? Because oftentimes uh, we're busy because we're trying to seek people's approval or because we're trying to keep people happy with us uh, or because we're trying to present some image of ourselves that's actually not true. But when we spend time in prayer connecting and communing with the God who loves us and who made us, then out of that place of fulfillment and love, we can then say, okay, this is what God has called me to do. This is what he's called me to do. And, and over here, yes, it's a good thing. I mean, just think about it. Jesus could have spent a whole other day healing a whole host of other people. And there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. People would look at that and say, that's good. That's beautiful. He's healing people. But instead, he says, no, what God is calling me to are these things over here. And because he knows the love of his father, he's able to say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. Yes to the best things and no to the distractions. So the purpose of prayer is not to just tell God our needs. He knows your needs already. But that when we spend time in prayer, we are reminded of how completely God loves us and how he has met our need in Jesus. And so then we step into our to-do list or our work or our relationships from a place of being fulfilled by that love. And so I can say yes to the things that he wants and no to the busyness of my life that's about approval from other people because I know God's love for me. And so don't forget the purpose of prayer. And that changes then whether or not you get an answer. And let's be honest, sometimes you pray and you pray and you pray and there's no answer. But maybe the love that God has for you is the answer that he wants you to feel and to experience. So that your circumstances might not change, but the, the satisfaction that you have in him you're reminded of that in the midst of the busyness or the pain or the stress or the suffering that you're facing. You see, Jesus' work began with prayer, and out of that place of prayer, he then was able to be effective in the work that God had for him. And so if we're going to be followers of Jesus, we need to embrace the same posture and the same practice. So we're going to talk about prayer over the next couple weeks. Uh, one of our motives as a church is pray boldly, that we believe that Followers of Jesus are called to pray, and that prayer actually works. And so we're going to talk about that over the next couple of weeks, and we're also going to spend time doing that together because it seems silly to take time talking about prayer but never actually pray together as we gather in this space. But I want to lay a challenge before you uh, based on the rhythms and the practices of Jesus. Uh, so in Luke chapter 5, in, in the parallel story that Luke tells, uh, Luke describes what Jesus does here slightly differently. He says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. So this wasn't a one-time thing. This is what he did often. So I want to lay a challenge in front of you or an invitation for you uh, to practice the rhythms of Jesus. And there's three things about Jesus' rhythm here. The first thing is it was often. And so he had a regular rhythm of stepping out of his to-dos, stepping out of the busyness, and entering a place of prayer. And so what does regular look like for you? How often? For Jesus, it seemed like it was a daily thing. But do you have a regular space in your day, in your week, in your month, where you are saying no to the busyness to spend time with God? Because here's the thing. We're busy people, but I bet you're not as busy as Jesus. You have important things to do, but not as important as Jesus did. And so what's your regular rhythm of stepping out? The second characteristic of Jesus' rhythm is that he stepped out into a place of solitude. And it says he went to desolate places or wilderness places. We think of those as negative, but for Jesus, they were places of strength. Places where he could be alone with no other distraction or no other noise and be in the presence of God. And so what is that place of solitude for you? Maybe it is the metro park. 
Maybe it is the cup of coffee that you have in uh, the living room before everyone else gets up. But what is that place of solitude that you go that this is the place of prayer? And so what's your regular rhythm? What's your place of solitude? And then lastly is this, spend time with God there. And he prayed in those places. And prayer can look like both telling God what's on your heart, but also taking time to listen through Scripture and through what the Spirit wants to say in that time of prayer. And so what's your regular rhythm? Where is your place of solitude? And how are you going to spend time with God in that space? Because everything else on your agenda will be powerless without knowing Jesus in this way. And so I want to lay that in front of you for the next week, two weeks, as we talk about prayer. Let's not just talk about it. Let's do it. Because this is how Jesus worked. And so let's follow him in that. Let me pray for us. I want to invite you, uh, maybe in this space of prayer, uh, just one thing. Maybe it's been a while for you since you prayed. Maybe you, you've never prayed, and you're like, I have no idea what to do. I want to invite you in this space to return to that place of prayer. We've got things that we, we're going to do in the rest of service. We've got songs to sing and announcements to give, but, but God is inviting you into the space uh, of, of remembering his grace, of remembering your need, of remembering your identity, and of spending time with him. And so I want to invite you uh, for just a moment in this space of prayer, of silence, to in your mind and in your heart, maybe just say a prayer to God. Just say, God, I'm here. God, I want to begin with you. Take just a moment and turn your heart there. And if, you, if you've never done that, if you're, if you're unsure of who Jesus is, he says, if you would know me, if you would turn from your sin and trust in me, I am the door and I am the way. So maybe it's simple as saying, Jesus, I need you. Just take a moment in silence and do that this morning. Scripture says that God is not very far from each one of us. That he is, in fact, searching us out. And that in Jesus, he's offering you not just rescue, but relationship, presence, his love. And so, God, we are reminded this morning of the rhythms of your son, Jesus, who in his ministry and the busyness and the to-dos, he, he began from this place of rest and prayer. God, will we be people like that? Through your grace and the presence of your Holy Spirit, would you, would you invite us into places of communion with you? Because everything else that we could do of plans and, uh, and strategies are pointless apart from you. And God, we thank you that you meet us in, our, in your grace and in the, in the love and the forgiveness of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray all of these things. And we come to you and the door is open. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.